before the tents, the pepper spray, the evictions, and all of those memes. Occupy Wall Street was a disparate group of activists roaming around Lower Manhattan. They felt cheated that American politics had become so bloated with corporate money that something had to give. No justice, no peace! Fuck the police! The original plan to physically occupy Wall Street itself on September 17th came down from Adbusters, a nonprofit, culture jamming magazine dedicated to open source dialogue and to stripping corporations of their power. But deciding to occupy privately held Zuccotti Park was a brilliant, on the fly move more of a hunch spread by word of mouth and Twitter than the stuff of arduous planning. We are going to occupy this park! It was an eclectic crowd those first few days. Some demonstrators had a clearer purpose than others. Some just seemed to be reveling in the attention. Others stayed a bit more on message. And then some people, like this guy, we're already upset about the direction that things seem to be heading. Unfortunately, we're deteriorating to what we always do on the American left. We're having a powwow. Let's burn down Wall Street! Let's go down there and let's burn it down! Monday morning! Yeah. Like so many modern day protests, the whole thing just kind of felt like uninspired, vaguely political performance art. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. But there were signs that it might be different this time around. Fellow citizens of the internet, we're anonymous. On September 17th, Anonymous will flood into Lower Manhattan. Vigilante hacktivist group Anonymous had thrown its weight behind the movement early on. This meant the park was teeming with hackers, programmers, live streamers, and advocates for open source technology. Wearing masks or not, they seemed determined to use their tools and their skills to help the cause. Within this diverse group of people, we met a 21-year-old from Kansas City. Like so many other occupiers, he'd recently dropped out of college. And some of his ideas caught our attention. My name is Isaac Wilder. I'm one of the directors of the Free Network Foundation. We build decentralized and distributed communication systems. Those communication systems are based around freedom towers. These independent Wi-Fi sources could be seen beaming out free, secure internet to occupiers in Los Angeles, Austin, Texas, and right here in New York since day one. There's the modems, the router, and the radios. For now, the modems that we're using connect to clear. In the future, we'll be able to replace those with modems that connect to our radios or to anybody's radios. The key, I guess, the secret sauce, right, is the software that's running on the router that, that lets you anonymize or tunnel or do these kind of fancy tricks with network traffic. Someday, our aspiration is to help humanity build its own actual network. Not a virtual network, but an actual network. But in the meantime, a virtual network is the best we can do. And, and it's, it's a necessary step in the process of bootstrapping an actual wide area network. It's about peer-to-peer -peer networks. People talking to one another directly and through no middleman. The idea is to build up mesh networks, where all points of connection, or nodes, simultaneously receive and release information. But on top of that, these nodes act as transmitters for other nodes, too. Isaac and the FNF are working to decentralize a global internet that's become wildly consolidated, and to redistribute the avenues we use to talk to one another. Mesh networking is not a new idea. It's been spreading around the world in recent years, a sort of pirate radio internet that connects underserved communities to the web and seeks to bypass the prying eyes of governments and corporations. 
if you kind of wind the clock back to the middle 60s when the Department of Defense decided they wanted to create a network of computer networks, which is where the internet came from. This is a Department of Defense government funded project right from the start. So it's so fascinating now here we are, you know, back almost 40 years later and the government has finally realized they've created a monster. is the progenitor of why we're here right now. Had I not had the internet and not been a member of Adbusters, then I guess I never would have heard of it. So. I can go online and I can help make changes, help make big changes with a group of people who, other than location, have nothing holding them back. Well, Facebook got me out here. Um, I belong to something, and they sent some message, and they said, yeah, we're going to be gathering in this park. And I said, you know what? I could do that. Wall Street is our street! Wall Street is our street! Wall Street is our street! You know, the protest produced such beautiful photos. People were aware of that. They were totally working that. Oh, this is going to be, you know, on, you know, I'll get 100 likes on Facebook tomorrow. And it, it was just, it was cool to watch that happen. internet allows an open discourse, an open dialogue, and that creates greater consciousness, right? So it's really been a vehicle, not just here, but in all these different places around the world where the, the information was suppressed, the injustice was just obviously a critical mass, and people got together and said, dude, we got to do something about this. Keep on moving on. You got to move on, people, and nobody get hurt. People got to get to work. They got to move on. Keep on moving on. Marx talks about the, the means of production and how the proletariat would ultimately take control of the means of production. Now, he could not imagine, right, the information economy. So, the question is no longer about the means of production, right, but the means of reproduction. To me, global revolution is when the 99% takes control of the means of reproduction of information. The internet, more than anything else, gives us the ability to circumvent um, corporate control over our interactions and allow us to connect directly with one another again. And the more peer-to-peer -peer we can imagine our internet, um, the more human it will be and the more it can realize its promise as the liberator of a people that has been in one kind or another of indentured servitude for more than half a millennium. The risk to that vision is that people will choose to, you know, either worship at Apple's altar rather than engage with one another and want the nice screen to touch and drag more than they want to interact with other human beings, that people will reduce what it is, what it means to be human to a Facebook profile's cookie cutter version of a, a human person, or that people will become so obsessed with keeping up with the tweet stream that they won't live in, in real time anymore. This, this wonderful open platform, which has always been compromised and you know, has always been there to advance the interests of the government from day one. You know, finally now we're at this, this reckoning moment. Who is gonna get to have the internet for themselves? I'm scared it's not gonna be us. The NYPD staged a mini-raid on Ducati in late October, confiscating the park's generators and deep-cycle batteries. Respect! Just a little bit. Transfer control protocol. We caught up with Isaac shortly after this raid, and he was joined by his buddy Tyrone, a kid from Vermont who'd recently dropped out of school to work with the FNF. Tyrone, it turns out, is the son of Jerry Greenfield of Ben & Jerry's Ice Cream. The folks that occupy are not anti-business. Uh, they are anti a system that advantages the few and does not give opportunity to the many. So I found these giant batteries, right? They each weigh 140 pounds, 245 amp hours. How big are they? They're big, they're like really big. 
and they're like five hundred dollars a piece. But I think that's the way to go. Oh, yeah. I'm gonna ask the GA for five grand, which is cool. Global government, which I think is inevitable because we are one globe, we are one planet, we are one species, uh, and we face global challenges. So in order to have universal human rights, and universal access, and universal education, and universal health, I think we're gonna have to break into very small assemblies and govern ourselves that way. That's why the occupation is not a protest, it's a demonstration. Uh, because we're demonstrating what one of those assemblies might look like. General Assembly! General Assembly! We'll begin! We'll begin! In about 10 minutes! In about 10 minutes! In this area! In this area! Come! Come! I'm supposed to have a proposal on the agenda and I just want to make sure it's on there. Batteries? Yeah. Sweet proposal. Like what up? What up? I'm Isaac. I'm Isaac. Uh, I'm here representing open source. I'm here representing open source. So, so, our budget proposal, our budget proposal is to bring power, is to bring power back to the park, back to the park. Electrical power, electrical power. Power to the people, power to the people. So, so, in order to do so, in order to do so, we would like to acquire, we would like to acquire a significant number, a significant number of deep cycle batteries, of deep cycle batteries, power inverters, power inverters, and chargers, and chargers. It goes without saying that the General Assembly approach can be grueling. Occupy is bursting with ideas. Everybody's got one, and an intense yearning to tell everybody else about that idea. But the GA is an actual political discussion. Isaac goes on to make the case for $5,500. He takes a few questions from the crowd, so the entire pitch lasted about a half hour. But eventually, he gets approval. We have consensus! Yay! Yay! Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. There is a material reality to the internet. Most people look at the internet as magic. I click a button, something happens, I get the information. They don't care to acknowledge the actual physical infrastructure that's moving that data. It's pipes in the ground, fiber optic cables in the ground, owned by people, owned, not by people, by corporations. AT&T, Level 3, Global Crossing, Hurricane Electric, Tata Indicom. These huge transit networks have a deep vested interest in maintaining the status quo. If there's any prospect of a successful global revolution, it's contingent upon our ability to build communications infrastructure outside of the ownership of those entities. So how does a free network figure into the movement? Well, it's not the movement but it is a necessary and foundational piece of infrastructure that has to be in place before the movement can fully blossom. Basically, we're trying to create a new, freer physical structure for the internet so that like, people can communicate on the internet without worrying that their information is being censored by a government, without worrying that a government or another organization is watching them, reading the data packets they send. Also, more importantly, just like creating an internet with a physical infrastructure that is cooperatively owned by all the people using it. You know, I was uh, uh, originally kind of writing pieces saying, you know, fuck this internet, let's build our own. If this internet is so centralized that the Arab dictators can flip it off with a switch, that, that Joe Lieberman can call up Amazon and PayPal and say, stop funding WikiLeaks, you know, then we want an internet where it can't be stopped. We want an uncensorable internet. And I listened to then um, uh, Ethan Zuckerman from Geek Corps, and he kind of argued the other way, and we had a good discussion about it. And he said, you know, Use the tools that are there as best you can until they stop working. Like we can't like independently create our own communications infrastructure in the U.S. Until we can put our own satellites up in the sky, until we can run our own cable, you're still going to have to deal with somebody who's regulating those wires. Hacking is not necessarily about reusing everything. Hacking is about taking an evil shit piece of corporate software like Facebook 
and using it for a local revolution. Hacking is taking cash, which was designed to extract value from you, and using it to fund somebody who's actually doing something that's gonna topple a friggin' bank. What's up, What's up Isaac? Isaac? Isaac invites us over to an office removed from Zuccotti. The owner of this workspace is sympathetic to Occupy. So at night, the place turns into a staging area and a sort of test lab for the Free Network Foundation. We'd been hearing a lot about the benefit of putting up a Freedom Tower, but we wanted to see how one of these things would actually work. We wanted to have sound effects, but we didn't have time. I love the instructions for operating a tower are plug it in, press the big green button. So basically, the router is connected on one side to the wide area network, so that is like the backhaul or, or wherever we're getting our upstream bandwidth from. You, you have this separation of components so that this is modular and you can, you can replace a WiMAX modem with whatever kind of modem or input that you want. The wide area connection comes into the router. The router is connected to the switch, which then connects it to the server. These two uh, connections go to power injectors for the two gateway radios. One on each ring is the gateway, and then the other two connect to that wirelessly and redistribute the signal in the other directions. There are an unbelievable number of ways that you can use this rig. I think the one that gets most people really excited is this prospect right, of a, a piece of software to match the General Assembly or any kind of software that we want to run locally, web software, whatever kind of software, we can run on, on, on this server. It's a Debian server, and it'll be accessible whether the wide area connection goes down, stays up, whatever. This has nothing to do with the global internet. This is available locally, which is really cool. This thing is intelligent. There's intelligence in this box, so it can say, okay, well, I'm storing all this media. As soon as I get a global connection, sync this up to a backup server. On top of money from Occupy's New York General Assembly, all this gear is being funded mostly through online donations, support from family and friends, private donors, and one unlikely source. In October 2011, Isaac and the FNF took the Freedom Tower to the Contact Summit. This conference was headed up by media critic Douglas Rushkoff. The idea was to bring together web-savvy innovators under one roof and to reinvent the entire notion of a conference. I mean, I, I came up with contact, you know, a, a good year before the Occupy movement, and the idea was just to fold the weird edges of the net back into the middle, right? That the net had become so commercialized, and I wanted to do an anti-conference conference, a conference that's saying, let's put our stake in the ground, let's take back the net. That entire conference was a buzz with talk of the occupation, and, and we were doing what everybody was talking about. I thought rather than just get them all together, why don't I try to get the people at this thing on the day of this conference to come up with ideas, join up with them, and then we'll push them out into the real world. And then I thought I'm going to not only do that but get money for them. Have the judges look and then figure out what do they like the best and give 10,000 of those things. Yeah, that's the biggest single chunk of money that we've gotten. Um, definitely. And, and the way they worked was there were three innovation prizes of equal amounts. Um, I think the money originally came from Pepsi, which is <laughs> funny. I asked everybody. I asked Intel. I asked every company I had ever done a talk for or anything for. And um, Pepsi had this whole social media thing. And then they said, sure, they'll do it. They'll give the money. You know, that was it. And I still haven't heard from them since. You know, it was the Kind of the cool thing. I mean, it's both, it's both the good and the bad thing about a corporation is they're out of touch with what they do, but, you know, whoever they are, the people at Pepsi, for all the bad that they do, there's also people there with access to money who want to do good. Did you have to reconcile the fact that that money did indeed come from Pepsi? Yeah, sure. Sure. I mean, it's a tricky thing, tricky thing, like, it's a, it's a broader issue too, like, okay, yeah, I mean, that money coming from Pepsi is like a small part of a bigger issue, which is consumer electronics in general um, have 
very dark story, very dark origins. Like this camera, um, my computer, my cell phone, like those are essentially made of suffering. Um, but you have to just couple that knowledge with a knowledge that people aren't going to relinquish these technologies voluntarily, as far as I can tell. Like, as an individual, I have very little control over that. My only option is don't buy the stuff. But I'm acting on faith that the actions that I'm taking will ultimately be redemptive and like will ultimately result in less net suffering. If we can take money from Pepsi and do something good with it, like that sounds like a, a, a good use of that money to me. I don't know, it, it, it does. On November 15th, nearly two months into the occupation, the NYPD raided Zuccotti Park in the early hours of the morning. Reports said that it was a violent bust em up but how could we know? The cops were sure to clear the press from the area. You're not happy about this, I can see it. I was out with friends who are also occupiers, and some of them got calls around 1 a.m. saying like, yo, the park is being raided, all hands on deck. And basically we got down there as fast as we could. They brought out some like really crazy sci-fi weapons. Like they had their like non-lethal sound cannon weapon thing, um, which from what I heard they attempted to fire but only accidentally hit police officers. I don't think the lowest point was the raid. That was like, there was adrenaline there. I wasn't, it wasn't low, it was like a high. There was fear there. If you're unafraid, you're just an idiot, you know? Isaac and Tyrone were among the hundreds of people arrested. After a first sweep through the park, a fleet of New York sanitation garbage trucks rolled up to cart away all of the abandoned stuff, including the Freedom Tower. There were reports of a grinding, gnashing noise as sanitation workers threw stuff onto the heap. Soon enough, the park was fenced off. And then came the power washers. By morning, Zuccotti had been flipped from a colorful, noisy urban campground back to a placid, corporate slab of concrete. That afternoon, occupiers descended on Zuccotti. They were armed with a temporary restraining order, and they had their targets set on reclaiming the space. Now the protesters are taking the park back. Yes, we are! Yes, we are! We have a court order! We have a court order! But despite that court order, their efforts were unsuccessful. Basically, the choice was like, stay and defend the park or like take your shit and leave. Two days later, we met up with Isaac. He'd just been released from jail and he agreed to let us come along with him to the sanitation department at 12th Avenue and 57th Street on the far west side. This is where everything from the raid had been dumped. List the items that you're looking to recover and be as descriptive as possible. Isaac just wants his stuff back. He's looking for about $5,000 in cash from the GA, his laptop, a backpack with a few personal items, and of course the Freedom Tower. Despite our best efforts, the cops didn't let us in. As we waited for Isaac to rummage around for his things, we met some other people who were there to do the same. And the guy took out a knife, ran it up my side, cut off my backpack like that. Who knew? This is going to make today much, much bigger, I think. 
and it might make it. I think people are angry, and I'm worried about it becoming really violent. But see, the cops are, you know, they're provoking it. It's a police state. I'm coming right back to you. Isaac emerges empty-handed after having sifted through a giant pile of mildew-ridden property. It had been an hour. I borrowed your camera. Yeah, no, my backpack is not there. The tower is not there. They took like all the computers and just like lined them up and hit them with a baseball bat. So I'm a little confused as to like how these officers sworn to protect the law are just standing here. I don't know how that works out. We wanted evidence of the damage, so we gave Isaac a cell phone so that he could take some pictures. It's like, you know, all the false arrests that they do. It's the same thing just with property, where it's like, oh, we know we don't have any right to do this. It's just to, like, slow you down and keep you off the street and keep you from being effective in what you want to do. But what they don't understand is that we don't need any of that stuff. Honestly, we're probably better off, like, living with our principles and just being like, all right, like, fuck it. All this material bullshit doesn't mean a fucking thing. It doesn't mean a fucking thing. A lot of evidence is gone. A lot lot of historical record is gone. Um, and, And that's a shame. That's a shame because people deserve to know what was happening there. So I, I think an, an, an injustice has been done. Do you, do you guys plan to build again? Build a new tower? Yeah, right away. Day after tomorrow, we're gonna build an, a new one. When we reached out to sanitation, a representative said there were no orders to destroy property. But he also said he wasn't surprised that some laptops may have been mishandled or misplaced. Spurned on by the eviction and all the disappeared possessions, demonstrators turned out en masse on November 17th. (laughs) It was a resurgence. And with even more arrests and reports of brutality, it all felt very much like what we'd seen over the last two months around the country and the world, a typically aggressive state response to nonviolent activism. By nightfall, people were flooding into lower Manhattan. Eventually, we joined up with a march as it disrupted traffic and ended at a rally at Thomas Paine Park, which is about a mile from Zuccotti. The place was packed. Estimates figured that close to 30,000 people had streamed into the area. Some people said that they could feel the ground shake. So for a moment, it was as if the whole world was finally watching. And the occupiers knew it. They even had their own bat signal. It was a huge show of solidarity with a movement that a lot of people assumed was already dead. The GA that night was massive. Until then, Occupy Wall Street's loudest meme was Zuccotti Park itself. And by clearing away the tents, the drum circles, and the Freedom Tower, the NYPD only seemed to have breathed new life into the demonstrations. We're just getting better at this. We're just learning how to organize. We're just like kids. You think that we've got people's attention now. Wait till we do what we've set out to do. I think right now, it's just the first sort of siren song of this bell chime that's gonna just reverberate. Maybe it's because I'm a young man, but I feel like I can go a while.